This video is the third in a series on the pantheism controversy. In our first video, we explored the philosophy of Spinoza and its reception in Germany, which first spurred the controversy. In the second video, we turn to Kant's response to the controversy, in which he tried to stake out a middle ground between reason and faith. In this video, we'll tackle Hegel's efforts to resolve the pantheism controversy by reconciling Spinoza and Kant, thereby attempting to complete the grand journey from nihilism to absolute spirit. G.W.F. Hegel was one of the leading philosophers of his generation and among the most influential in the history of Western philosophy. He lived at a time of great historical change. A teenager at the dawn of the French Revolution, he personally witnessed the Emperor Napoleon ride through Jena in 1806, the world spirit on horseback, as Hegel famously described him. Hegel's encyclopedic system of philosophy attempted to integrate every domain of human inquiry, from logic, natural science, anthropology, psychology, economics, politics, history, art, and religion to philosophy itself, surveying everything from ancient Greek tragedy, Newtonian physics, classical economics, romantic poetry, Lutheran theology, and the history of philosophy from the pre-Socratics to his own time. Alongside J.G. Fichte and F.W.J. Schelling, Hegel is typically classified as one of the key figures of German idealism, which emerged in the wake of the two watershed German intellectual events of the late 18th century that we've reviewed so far. The revival of Spinoza, thanks to the pantheism controversy, and Kant's Copernican revolution in philosophy. All of the German idealists had the ambition of reconciling Spinoza and Kant in one way or another, and Hegel was no exception. One way to understand this ambition is to see it as a continued attempt to respond to the problem of nihilism in the modern world, as first diagnosed by Jacobi. Hegel, like his fellow German idealists, thought that Spinoza's philosophy represented the most consistent form of pre-Kantian modern rationalism. Spinoza's virtues were his grand vision of the unity of all things, the one and all, or henkai pan in Greek, of Spinoza's God or nature, and its consummation in the infinite bliss of the intellectual love of God. So important was Spinoza for Hegel that Hegel declares Spinoza to be the beginning of all genuine philosophy. Quote, thought must begin by placing itself at the standpoint of Spinozism. To be a follower of Spinoza is the essential beginning of all philosophy. Going on to affirm that one is either a Spinozist or no philosopher at all. But Hegel agreed with Jacobi and Kant that Spinozism as such ultimately entails a denial of human freedom and subjectivity. In Spinoza's system, we are merely cogs in the great machine of nature, merely finite modes of the infinite substance. For Hegel, Spinoza wasn't guilty of atheism, as his early critics thought, but rather of a cosmism, that is the view that the world does not exist, since only God exists. Ultimately, a cosmism, Hegel argued, is tantamount to a kind of nihilism, since we don't have genuine independent existence, being merely finite cogs in nature's infinite machine, we don't genuinely matter. We're merely epiphenomena of nature, stray bits of finitude sloughed off of infinity. Nature, God, doesn't need us. But according to Hegel, Jacobi's own solution, his irrational leap of faith, or salto mortale, is just as inadmissible. On Hegel's view, it amounts to a dogmatic return to traditional authority, giving up everything that was truly important in the breakthrough of modernity. Moreover, Jacobi's irrational faith in the tra traditional transcendent personal God leads down its own road to nihilism. Without knowledge of God, knowledge of the absolute, we are always liable to slide back into nothingness. And even if Jacobi's irrational faith could secure the vision of the traditional transcendent personal God, this too ultimately leads to nihilism in a proto-Nietzschean sense, as Hegel argues the denial of this world 
by fleeing into a transcendent beyond is merely the flip side of the death of God, a variation of the same acosmism Hegel found troubling in Spinoza. Now, in Kant's critical philosophy, Hegel found vital positive elements, the absolute autonomy of human reason, the unconditional dignity of the individual, and the infinite freedom of the human subject. Yet for Hegel, Kant's critical compromise between reason and faith, staking everything on rational faith, runs into its own dire problems by denying us knowledge of the absolute, knowledge of our true selves, and knowledge of God. We have no secure buttress against the nihilistic void. The split between appearance and reality, nature and freedom, theory and practice, is and ought, amount to a denial of this worldliness, putting our hopes in an inaccessible beyond, cut off from nature, from God, from each other, and from ourselves, or so Hegel argues. How is Hegel going to find his way out of this Kantian predicament? Hegel offers a famous programmatic statement in the preface to his Phenomenology of Spirit. Everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, not only as substance, but equally as subject. Substance here should be understood as referring to Spinoza's conception of God as the one infinite substance of nature, the target of the pantheism controversy, while subject can be understood as referring above all to Kant's view of the infinite freedom of human subjectivity, which stands at the center of his Copernican revolution. So Hegel is saying that the truth requires finding a higher unity or synthesis of Spinoza and Kant, that is, of substance and subject. Hegel immediately goes on to explain the limitations of Spinoza's position as he sees it, writing, if the conception of God as the one substance, Spinoza's conception of God, shocked the age in which it was proclaimed, the reason for this was, on the one hand, an instinctive awareness that in this definition, self-consciousness was only submerged and not preserved. What Hegel argues here is that self-consciousness, namely human subjectivity and freedom, and the human subject in general is submerged in Spinoza's substance, losing its independence, becoming a mere cog in the machine of nature. For Hegel, Spinoza's substance is simply untroubled equality and unity with itself, a purely positive infinity that affirmatively expresses itself as infinite attributes and modes, but in such a way that never changes or affects the underlying substance itself. What is missing from Spinoza, Hegel believes, is what he calls negativity, which is the motor of all processes of self-development and self-realization. For Hegel, the absolute must be conceived as the process of its own becoming, the circle that presupposes its end as its goal, having its end also as its beginning, and only by being worked out to its end is it actual, or better yet, actualized. Thus, the life of God and divine cognition may well be spoken of as a disporting of love with itself, but this idea sinks into mere edification and even insipidity if it lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience, and the labor of the negative. Here we find a further subtle critique of Spinoza. While Hegel affirms Spinoza's view that divine cognition, what Hegel will ultimately call absolute knowing, is a disporting of love with itself, God loving God's self, the intellectual love of God participating in God's own infinite self-love, he faults Spinoza for missing the dimension of the negative, its seriousness, suffering, patience, and labor. But what exactly is this labor of the negative, and why is it so important for Hegel. In what I think is one of the, his most beautiful passages, Hegel explains, the life of spirit is not the life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation, but rather the life that endures it and maintains itself in it. It wins its truth only when, in utter dismemberment, it finds itself. It is this power not as something positive, which closes its eyes to the negative, as when we say of something that it is nothing or is false, and then having done with it, 
turn away and pass on to something else. On the contrary, spirit is this power only by looking the negative in the face and tarrying with it. In a word, it is only through suffering, death, devastation, and dismemberment that spirit, human beings, can learn and develop, that we can win our truth. Spinoza, as a thinker of pure positivity, wants nothing to do with death. As he writes, a free man thinks of death least of all things, and his wisdom is a meditation not of death, but of life. How much more so does Spinoza's God have nothing to do with death, with suffering, or with negativity? Spinoza's God can neither suffer nor die. But as we'll see, Hegel will argue, it is precisely by passing through the suffering and death of God, that is, the experience of nihilism itself, that absolute knowing can be achieved. Crucially, Hegel praises Spinoza's holism his view of the one and all where everything belongs to the, to the divine whole. Yet Hegel contends that this whole is not a starting point as it is in Spinoza, but rather the result of a process of self-development. The true is the whole, but the whole is nothing other than the essence consummating itself through its own development. Of the absolute, it must be said that it is essentially a result, and only in the end is it what it truly is. In particular, this development for Hegel will prove to be a historical development in which human beings realize the absolute through the work of their own freedom. As, as in Kant, then, Hegel sees human freedom as the crux of the story. It is this subjective freedom that constitutes the power of negativity, which can break through the necessity of substance. For Spinoza, we human beings are merely finite modes of God, who is the infinite substance of nature, mechanically pushed and pulled around by the necessity of the laws of nature. For Hegel, in contrast, we human beings have the freedom to break with necessity, whether with the apparent necessity of our own nature as animal organisms by becoming spirit, or with the apparent necessity of our social political world by creating a new world. Whereas Kant sees the goal of freedom to be only the moral achievement of the highest good, an infinite ideal that we can only ever approach asymptotically forever out of reach in the beyond. Hegel, in contrast, sees the goal as the absolute self-knowledge of the absolute, or simply absolute knowing, which just is the fully realized system of philosophy itself, a goal that can be achieved here and now. Indeed, in a sense, for Hegel, the absolute is always already with us, in and for itself all along, and of its own volition, even if we haven't made it explicit to ourselves. After all, the absolute has its end also as its beginning, and only by being worked out to its end is it actualized. This will all hopefully become clearer if we consider an overview of Hegel's mature philosophical system as a whole, as found in his Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences. Hegel's Encyclopedia has three major divisions, logic, nature, and spirit. As he tells us, logic, nature, and spirit are the three modes of the absolute idea, essentially Hegel's technical term for God. Hegel maintains that these three modes are represented by the three persons of the Trinity in Christianity. Logic is the Father, nature the Son, and spirit is, you guessed it, the Holy Spirit. Logic is God's eternal essence before the creation of nature and spirit, the eternal mind of God or the divine logos. It is presented as simultaneously a science of pure thinking and a science of being, an ontology and a theology all in one, systematically developing all the pure categories of thought conceived over the whole history of metaphysics from a presuppositionless beginning in the pure thought of pure being. For example, being, nothing, becoming, appearance and essence, possibility, actuality, and necessity, the true, the good, and the absolute idea itself. The absolute idea just is thought thinking itself. Aristotle's conception of God as the noesis, noesios, noesis, or thinking, thinking, thinking. 
containing all the pure categories of thought that have been developed over the course of the science of logic. The absolute idea thereby returns us in a circle to the beginning of logic as the science of pure thinking itself. But the first stage in Hegel's systematic triad, logic, properly ends with the decision of the absolute idea to release itself from its own pure thinking into the externality of space and time, represented to us as God's decision to create the world. And so from the end of logic, we are led to nature, that is, the natural world of space and time. In his treatments of nature, Hegel covers all the objects or subjects of the natural sciences, from mechanics to physics to organics, including the earth, plant life, and as the highest form of nature, animal life. The animal organism, on Hegel's account, faces its own inherent limitations in its experience of sexuality and mortality, the finitude of death to which every living thing must succumb. But one special animal organism, the human being, is able to overcome this deadlock of the sex drive and the death drive in order to achieve something higher, something more profound. This is the transition from nature to spirit, or Geist, which despite its spooky sounding name is just Hegel's technical term for human beings and everything that human beings are uniquely capable of. Lastly, Hegel further divides spirit into three, subjective spirit, objective spirit, and absolute spirit. Subjective spirit covers the individual human subject, again, itself divided into three, anthropology, phenomenology, and psychology. Objective spirit covers the objective social and political world that human beings create for themselves, divided into abstract right, morality, and finally, ethical life, the family, civil society, and the state. Subjective spirit and objective spirit remain, however, merely finite spirit, while absolute spirit alone is infinite spirit, the highest stage of objective spirit, and so the highest stage of finite spirit as a whole, is world history, the stage on which humanity undergoes its historical development. World history thereby immediately precedes absolute spirit. Though the precise understanding of the transition from world history to absolute spirit is contentious, one way of interpreting it would be to say that the goal of world history is to produce absolute spirit. But what exactly is absolute spirit? Absolute spirit is simply Hegel's name for the three ways that human beings grasp and express matters of absolute importance in our individual and collective lives. And these are art, religion, and philosophy. For Hegel, art, religion, and philosophy all share the same absolute content, which is the absolute idea itself. But they each express this same content in different forms. Art in the form of sensibility, what can be apprehended by the senses, the sound of music, the sight of a painting, and so on, which we relate to through sensuous feeling. Religion expresses the absolute in the form of representation. For example, the narratives of the Bible or religious rituals, which we relate to through faith. And finally, philosophy expresses the absolute in the form of the concept, rational philosophical argumentation, which we relate to through conceptual thinking. Hegel, unsurprisingly, argues that philosophy is the highest form of absolute spirit because its form is uniquely adequate to its content, namely the absolute itself. Hegel maintains that conceptual thought allows the philosopher to grasp the absolute as it truly is by rationally and systematically demonstrating the absolute truths of philosophy rather than merely feeling them or having faith in them, as in art and religion, respectively. In a sense, then, philosophy alone is capable of comprehending what art and religion merely apprehend through feeling and faith. Philosophy, on Hegel's account, grounds its claims in rational proofs rather than aesthetic inspiration or religious revelation. But in general, we can say that absolute spirit constitutes spirit's own self-apprehension or self-knowledge, whether in aesthetic, religious, or philosophical form. Now, if we recall that for Hegel, spirit is itself a mode of the absolute idea of God, God's self, 
then absolute spirit, in fact, constitutes God's own self-knowledge of God's self, as realized via art, religion, and philosophy. If absolute spirit is the goal of history, all the vicissitudes of history, its trials and tribulations, its crimes and catastrophes from the ancient world to the medieval world to the modern world, as Hegel himself traces it, then we can say that the goal of history is not merely for spirit to undergo social political development, but ultimately for God to attain God's own self-knowledge in and through humanity. As Hegel writes, humanity knows God only insofar as God knows God's self in humanity. This knowledge is God's self-consciousness. The spirit of humanity, to know God, is simply God's spirit itself. In other words, the goal of history is for the absolute idea, God, to come to self-awareness through absolute spirit, God's paths of self-knowledge, for the sake of its own infinite spiritual enjoyment. As the final sentence of Hegel's encyclopedia puts it, the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders, and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. This would finally explain why the absolute idea initially created the spatio-temporal world in the first place, so that it could come to know itself, to enjoy itself as absolute spirit. God without creation would not be God. God without creation cannot know God's self. If logic is the idea in itself, and nature the idea outside of itself, spirit is the idea returned to itself in a grand systematic circle. Only by traversing this circle, by proceeding from the beginning to the end and back to the beginning, can God finally become and know who God truly is as we finally become and know who we truly are. As the Hadith says, I was a hidden treasure that wished to be known, so I created the world to which I made myself known, so that I might be known. Where does all of this leave Hegel in relation to the burning issue of pantheism? In fact, this issue was so important for Hegel that he devoted an enormous remark to it in the very last section of the encyclopedia on philosophy itself, the highest stage of absolute spirit. There he recounts that philosophy has often been accused of both atheism, not enough God, and of pantheism, too much God, both obviously referring initially to Spinoza, but then also later to the German idealists themselves, including Hegel, who were inspired by Spinoza's vision of the one and all in the wake of the pantheism controversy. The charge of pantheism, instead of atheism, against philosophy, belongs especially to modern culture, which finds in philosophy too much God, so much so that God is supposed to be, in fact, everything, and everything to be God. But Hegel contends that this naive version of pantheism, in which everything, that is, empirical things without distinction, the commonplace, as well as those more highly regarded, is regarded as equally and universally divine. This is not even true of Spinoza's philosophy, never mind of Hegel's himself. Of the philosophies to which the name, that is, pantheism, has been given, for example, the Iliadic or Spinozist, so far are they from identifying God with the world and making him finite, that in these philosophies, this everything, the world, has no truth, that we should more correctly designate them as a cosmisms. In other words, even Spinoza, according to Hegel, does not identify the finite things of the world, the all or everything of the pan in pantheism, as simply identical with God, but rather denies that this everything, the world, has any genuine independent existence at all. For Spinoza, finite things cannot be identified with God as such, since God is the infinite substance of nature, whereas determinate finite things are not this substance itself, but merely modes of it, mere negations of God's infinity, since every determination is a negation, as Spinoza famously puts it, mere nothings.
Notwithstanding Hegel's efforts to redeem Spinoza from the charge of a pernicious and naive pantheism, Hegel, of course, still finds Spinoza's systems to be limited, as he writes. The fault of all of these modes of representation and systems is that they do not proceed to the determination of substance as subject and as spirit. As we saw Hegel argue back in the preface to the phenomenology as well. As we have seen in Hegel's own view, everything that exists does indeed belong to the absolute idea. Logic, nature, and spirit are the three manifestations of the absolute idea, and together they cover the whole of reality, all of what exists. If the absolute idea is God, then it would seem that everything that exists is a part of God. But Hegel insists that everything is not a part of God equally and in the same respect. It isn't true that this rock, this table, this dog, this person, this community, this poem, this prayer, and so on, are all equally God in one and the same way, without distinction. For one thing, it is not the mere empirical details of things that are divine, but rather their inner essence or concept, more accurately, their idea, as presented in the encyclopedia system. Accordingly, each thing can be more or less divine by more or less actualizing its own inner essence or idea. But most importantly, everything has its place within the differentiated systematic structure of the absolute idea and can only be identified with God in reference to its role within that structure. In other words, the unity of all things in God is not an abstract unity, mere identity but rather a concrete unity. As Hegel writes, each stage of the advance is a peculiar determination of this concrete unity. And the deepest and last of the determinations of unity is the determination of absolute spirit. So the things of nature, rocks, planets, stars, the earth, bacteria, plants, animals, are all part of God, the absolute idea but only insofar as we understand nature itself to be merely the absolute idea outside of itself or in its externality. In other words, the things of nature are not yet the highest or most complete self-expression of God, insofar as they cannot achieve a self-awareness or self-knowledge of themselves as God's own self-expression. Only spirit, human beings, will be able to achieve this self-knowledge. Spirit is thus God in a higher sense than nature, since spirit is the absolute idea returned to itself from nature's mere externality. Nature is then merely a moment of God's self-realization. God must lose or forget God's self in nature in order to find God's self again in spirit. But even all of spirit cannot be identified with God equally and without further distinction. As finite spirit, subject of an object of spirit, up to and including world history itself, these are merely finite moments of God's self-actualization. Only infinite spirit, which is absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy, is a fully adequate and complete self-realization of God, the absolute idea, insofar as it constitutes the attainment of God's own absolute self-knowledge. In other words, for Hegel, we human beings are all a part of God, but not just any part. When we practice art, religion, and philosophy, we become that part of God that attains to self-realization and self-knowledge. We are the part of God that completes the grand journey of God's own self-actualization. By achieving the absolute knowledge, of the absolute. Hegel's absolute knowing, which just is his whole encyclopedia system, constitutes absolute knowledge of the absolute in both senses of the word. It is absolute knowledge about the absolute, but it is equally the absolute's own knowledge, its knowledge of itself. Because the absolute is not something outside of us, it is us. We are the absolute coming to know itself absolutely.
we are God coming to know God's self. And it is through our freedom that we come to do so. Namely, our freedom as it plays out over the course of history, whose trials and tribulations are the great stage on which humanity learns about itself and comes to know itself. Although there is a long-standing tradition of interpreting Hegel as promoting the notion of historical necessity, as opposed to genuine freedom, it seems to me that any historical necessity in Hegel can only be retrospective. That is, the events of the historical past were necessary for getting us where we are today. And indeed, Hegel's whole philosophy of history involves a grand retrospective reconstruction of the narrative of our historical past up until his own present, which aims to explain how those past events produced the contemporary world. But it seems to me that he, Hegel clearly rules out any notion of prospective historical necessity. Rather, the future is always up to us. Spirit always has the radical freedom to transform the world and to transform itself. Hegel is the first to acknowledge that the course of history is a painful one. It is full of suffering and pain, crime and injustice. This is the great power of the negative, the movement of destruction that tears down empires. But through each of these difficult moments, spirit comes to deepen its own knowledge of itself. It wins its truth and finds itself in its dismemberment, as Hegel writes. It is in our darkest days, when all seems to be lost, that we come to know who we truly are. Only by losing ourselves can we find ourselves again. The result of this history is to give rise to absolute spirit, for us to reach absolute self-knowledge through art, religion, and philosophy, and thereby for the absolute idea to achieve its infinite enjoyment as absolute spirit. As one final way of making sense of Hegel's position, allow me briefly to invoke Hegel's famous notion of the true infinite, the Wahrhafte Unendlichkeit, which constitutes Hegel's positive account of the relation between the finite and the infinite, and contrast Hegel's view of the infinite with that of Kant and Spinoza. Recall Spinoza's view on this relation. God is the infinite substance of nature, and all finite things are mere modes of this substance. While all finite things are thus in God, they are merely God's epiphenomenal expressions, emanated outward from God without any fundamental significance for or meaningful effect upon the infinite substance itself. Now, in contrast, consider again Kant's view. We finite human beings are always striving to get closer and closer to the infinite, to God and to our own moral perfection, but the infinite always remains out of reach beyond our grasp. Hegel calls the conception of infinity entailed by this Kantian separation or opposition between the finite and the infinite, the bad infinite, schlechte unendlichkeit, that is, not truly infinite at all. By definition, as Spinoza already knew, the infinite qua unlimited cannot have the finite outside of it, otherwise the infinite would be limited by the finite, which is impossible. The finite must be included within the infinite in order to be truly infinite. Yet Hegel argues against Spinoza that the infinite cannot simply precede the finite, as Spinoza's infinite substance precedes its finite modes, but must rather be the result of the self-overcoming of the finite. After all, the absolute is a result. In other words, the infinite is only truly infinite if it lowers, contracts, or negates itself in the finite, and then returns to itself by negating this negation in a higher positivity, by negating finitude in a higher infinity. The true infinite is thus a grand circle in which the infinite loses itself in the finite, and then returns to itself from finitude to infinity. This is what the whole story of Hegel's encyclopedia is about. God's infinite and eternal essence, logic, negates itself in the finitude of nature, 
only for this negation to be negated in the infinity of spirit. This final moment, philosophy brings itself back to the beginning of logic, completing the infinite circle. Likewise, God's infinitude finitizes itself as finite spirit, subjective and objective, only for this finitude to be overcome in turn by infinite spirit, absolute spirit. So in Hegel's picture, we finite human beings matter to God because it is only in us and through us, through our own overcoming of our finitude in the infinite spirit of art, religion, and philosophy, that God can realize and know God's self. We are not merely finite modes of God. We are the infinite spirit coming to self-realization. We are infinity coming to know itself. So much for Hegel's views on pantheism. But what does this all have to do with the problem of nihilism and the death of God? To begin with, we need to disambiguate at least three different meanings of the famous phrase, God is dead. First, there is the meaning associated with Nietzsche, with which we began this whole investigation. For Nietzsche, God is dead means the traditional religion and religious philosophy have lost their grip on us. At the end of a long process of secularization that had begun with the onset of modernity, with the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, European civilization in the late 19th century could no longer believe in the old religious and philosophical dogmas about the existence of God, the freedom of the will, or the immortality of the soul. Hence, God is dead and we have killed him. But without faith in God to give us meaning and purpose in our lives, we are cast adrift into an absurd and meaningless cosmos. This is the problem of nihilism, as Nietzsche understands it. Of course, Nietzsche has his own solution to this problem, namely the creation of our own new values, but this is another story. Yet in a great moment of irony, the second meaning of God is dead is a classical expression of traditional Christian faith. In Christianity, God is dead is simply a factual description of the moment of the crucifixion, where Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, incarnated in human form, literally dies on the cross. Of course, according to the Christian narrative, the story doesn't end with this death of God. Three days later, Jesus is resurrected, and after his ascension, the third person of the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, depends, descends upon and dwells within the community of the faithful in Jerusalem at Pentecost. In a way, these first two meanings of God is dead appear to be radically opposed to one another. The first is a declaration of the end of traditional religion, while the second is an affirmation of traditional Christian theology. I want to suggest that the third meaning, the meaning offered by Hegel, offers a seemingly impossible higher synthesis of these first two in a way that also radically transforms them both. Let's first simply read what Hegel says about it in his lectures on the philosophy of religion. God has died. God is dead. This is the most frightful of all thoughts, that everything eternal and true is not, that negation is found in God. The deepest anguish, the feeling of complete irretrievability, the annulling of everything that is elevated, is bound up with this thought. However, the process does not come to a halt at this point. Rather, a reversal takes place. God, that is to say, maintains himself in this process, and the latter is only the death of death. The death of Christ is the death of this death itself, the negation of negation. It is out of infinite love that God has made himself identical with what is alien to him in order to put it to death. Now, on the face of it, this can be read 
as a simple exposition of traditional Christian religion. Yet we must remember Hegel's view that religion is merely the second form of absolute spirit, while philosophy is the third and final form. Religion and philosophy have the same content, the absolute, but religion merely represents this content, while philosophy comprehends it. So for Hegel, the death of Jesus is only a representation of a deeper philosophical truth, namely the truth that negation is found in God, that God must undergo the deepest anguish, the annulling of everything elevated, in order to achieve God's own self-realization, which comes with the negation of negation into a higher positivity. In other words, for Hegel, God is dead represents the necessary moment of negativity within the process of God's own self-actualization. If we superimpose Hegel's triad onto the Christian trinity and say that logic is God the Father, nature is the Son, and spirit is the Holy Spirit, then we would say that nature must be negated, the Son must die, in order for spirit to live. Or equally, we can say that the finitude of finite spirit, whose highest shape is world history, recall, the deepest anguish and denulling of everything elevated that is constitutive of that slaughter bench of history, as Hegel infamously calls it. This is needed in order to be negated as infinite spirit, that is absolute spirit. Or equally, we can say that the infinite must undergo the finitization and death that is the fate of all finite things in order to return to itself again as the true infinite. Or, as Hegel explains in the phenomenology, God is dead can be taken to express the negativity necessary for the unity of substance and subject. As Hegel writes, God himself is dead. This hard saying is the expression of innermost self-knowledge, the return of consciousness into the depths of the night in which I equals I, a night which no longer distinguishes or knows anything outside of it. This feeling is in fact the loss of substance, but it is at the same time the pure subjectivity of substance. This knowing is the inbreathing of spirit, whereby substance becomes subject, by which its abstraction and lifelessness have died. And substance, therefore, has become actual and simple and universal self-consciousness. In this way, therefore, spirit is self-knowing spirit. It knows itself. What moves itself, that is spirit. It is the subject of the movement and is equally the moving itself, or the substance through which the subject moves. It is subject, so also it is substance. And hence, it is itself spirit just because and insofar as it is this movement. What Hegel might be saying here is something like this. If Spinoza represents the philosophy of substance par excellence, and if Kant represents the philosophy of the subject par excellence, then, as Hegel explains, the experience of the death of God is the key to finding that higher unity of Spinoza and Kant, of substance and subject. As Hegel tells us, it is only by experiencing the total loss of substance in the death of God that the human subject can come to realize that spirit is both substance and subject. Spirit is both the absolute all-encompassing whole, substance as in Spinoza, as well as absolute self-determining freedom, the subject as in Kant, together as one, the absolute all-encompassing, collective, self-determining freedom of humanity, whose highest expression is its own absolutely free, collective, aesthetic, religious, and philosophical self-comprehension, self-expression, and self-enjoyment. This all still remains somewhat obscure, no doubt. For a little clarity, it may be helpful to turn to one of Hegel's earlier texts, Faith and Knowledge, which is a study and critique of Kant. Jacobi and Fichte, which ends with a consideration of the relation between religion and philosophy, specifically as it concerns the death of God. 
in the person of Jesus in the crucifixion. There, in faith and knowledge, Hegel writes, the pure concept or infinity as the abyss of nothingness in which all being is engulfed must signify the infinite grief of the finite, purely as a moment of the supreme idea and no more than a moment. Formerly, the infinite grief existed only historically in the formative process of culture. It existed as the feeling that God himself is dead, upon which the religion of more recent times rests, the same feeling that Pascal expressed in, so to speak, surely empirical form. Nature is such that it signifies everywhere a lost God, both within and outside man. By marking this feeling as a moment of the supreme idea, it must reestablish for philosophy the idea of absolute freedom, and along with it, the absolute passion, the speculative Good Friday in place of the historic Good Friday, which commemorates Jesus' crucifixion. Good Friday must be speculatively reestablished in the whole truth and harshness of its God-forsakenness. The highest totality canon must achieve its resurrection solely from this harsh consciousness of loss, encompassing everything and descending in all of its earnestness out of its deepest ground to the most serene freedom of its shape. Hegel here begins by exhibiting the finitude of the finite as the site of infinite grief cast into the abyss of nothingness. Let's take this to be the experience of finite spirit, up to and including its highest shape, the infinite grief of history. This abyss of nothingness is, in effect, the experience of nihilism, the hard saying that God himself is dead. Hegel does not want us to flee or run away from this experience, but exactly the opposite. It is only through the infinite grief of finitude, through the nihilistic abyss, through the death of God, that we can reestablish the idea of absolute freedom. How? By establishing the speculative Good Friday in place of the historic Good Friday. Good Friday, of course, is the day on which Christians commemorate the crucifixion of Jesus, the moment of the death of God in traditional Christian theology. The historic Good Friday would refer to Jesus' crucifixion as a putatively historical event, happening roughly 2,000 years ago, as held by the Christian tradition. But as we know, for Hegel, this religious teaching is merely a representation of a philosophical, conceptual truth, namely the necessary moment of negativity in the self-actualization of absolute spirit. Thus, the speculative Good Friday would refer to this properly philosophical insight as per Hegel's self-description of his system as speculative philosophy or speculative idealism. Now, what would it mean for Good Friday to be, as Hegel says, speculatively reestablished in the whole truth and harshness of its God-forsakenness? Recall what Jesus, according to the Gospels, cries out on the cross. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is quite a surprising thing to say, for if, as Christianity maintains, Jesus is God, how could he be forsaken by God? Yet in Hegel's view, this paradox is precisely the point. God forsakes God's self. In other words, God loses God's self. God negates God's self. God lets God's self die. God becomes God forsaken. To paraphrase G.K. Chesterton, God for an instant becomes an atheist, or even we might say God for a moment becomes a nihilist. So when we face the moment of our own infinite grief, when we feel most alone and forsaken by God, when we pass through the abyss of nihilism, it is then that we are in fact closest to God, closest to God's own experience of God forsakenness. Of course, this Christological analysis is just Hegel's own particular way of reaching certain universal philosophical truths, which in principle could be reached by other means. For example, as the contemporary scholar Paul Franks has pointed out, this is not unlike the Lurianic myth in which God 
in the act of tzimtzum, or self-contraction, loses consciousness of God's self, so that room for the other, for doubt, for freedom, and for our independence, could be born. So that we could traverse back through the darkness of the void, to rediscover the fullness of ourselves. God's self, willfully. Like Adam and Eve, severed apart from back to back, so they, so we, could come to know each other, come to know ourselves, our whole selves, face to face. For Hegel, what dies on the cross is the very notion of a God out there in the beyond who could come and save us, redeeming us from our God-forsakenness. What dies is religion itself, or at least a certain conception of religion, as holding on to a God out there. The death of God on the cross is the death of the abstraction of the divine being. The conception of God as an alien being, pulling the strings of the universe from behind the scenes, so to speak. This abstract God of the beyond, the precise God in whom Jacobi had an irrational faith, and in whom Kant had a rational faith, is indeed dead and gone. But what comes in its place is God as the Holy Spirit. God as the divinity of spirit itself, the human community itself. Jesus would represent the union of the human and the divine, but only in a single individual. The individual God-man must die, so that all of humanity can recognize its own divinity. God became man so that man could become God, as Athanasius of Alexandria, among other fathers of the Church, have put it. If God is now spirit, then we can't rely on anyone but ourselves to save us. It is up to us, and us alone, to effect our salvation. We have been delivered over to our own radical freedom. God, so to speak, has handed us the reins. And wasn't this the lesson of modernity all along? If God is dead, then spirit, humanity, must face its absolute freedom. But of course, for Hegel, God is not simply dead. It is out of the harsh consciousness of loss, encompassing everything, that the resurrection of God as spirit is achieved. From out of the death of finite spirit comes God's resurrection as absolute spirit. This all leads to an astonishing conclusion. The historical experience of the problem of nihilism and the death of God, with which we began, is itself a necessary moment in the process of God's own self-realization. The story we have been telling, which looked to be merely a bit of interesting intellectual history, the story from Spinoza to Jacobi, Lessing, and Mendelssohn to Kant, and finally to Hegel, is itself a story of God coming to self-knowledge, of the absolute idea coming to know itself as absolute spirit, and specifically the highest form of absolute spirit, namely philosophy. The historical experience of our utter God-forsakenness in modernity, nihilism and the death of God, which would appear to condemn us to the furthest possible distance from God, is in fact the very experience through which God comes to know God's self, and in which we come to know ourselves, which in the end amounts to the very same thing. To overcome the problem of nihilism is then not simply to return to some more innocent epoch from the past, but to push through the abyss until we come out the other side as absolute spirit. Of course, this story stretches back before Spinoza and modernity to the medieval world, to the ancient world, and before, back to the very beginnings of human history. And arguably, it stretches forward from Hegel up until our own time. It is our story, the story of us, you and me, as we struggle to know each other and ourselves, to know our place in the world, to know God. The next chapter in this story still remains to be written.
As grand and inspiring as Hegel's vision might be, it certainly leaves plenty of open questions, as well as plenty of room for criticisms and objections. Already in Hegel's day, his readers began to debase the nature of the historical process of the absolute's self-actualization. Was this process already completed in Hegel's own time? Was absolute spirit already fully achieved through Hegel's own philosophical system? Or was there further development still to be done? Does this process of God's self-realization even have an endpoint, whether already achieved or still in the future? Or is it necessarily open-ended, always looking forward to new possibilities? After his death, Hegel's followers split into two rival camps, the right or old Hegelians and the left or young Hegelians. Each had diametrically opposed interpretations of the central Hegelian thesis of the union of God and humanity. For the old Hegelians, this union was a vindication of the rational core of the Christian religion, in which humanity can attain to the heights of divinity, as in Christian mysticism, for example. But for the young Hegelians, it meant that God was really just a fancy old name for human beings themselves. And thus the superstitions of religious representations were finally to be overcome through their conceptual comprehension in philosophy, as in Ludwig Feuerbach's materialism, for example. Perhaps, as always with Hegel, the truth of the matter is a higher speculative unity of these two positions. In any event, without a truly transcendent God distinct from humanity, that is spirit, has the problem of nihilism really been solved? If Hegel's view of the death of God teaches us that there is no God of the beyond to save us, that we are left to our own devices, a radical freedom, to be sure, and that history is simply ours to make, aren't we still left bereft of any genuine meaning or purpose? Isn't it all now simply the nihilism of the freedom of self-negating negativity in the Hegelian sense? Likewise, after Hegel's death, his former seminary roommate and longtime philosophical rival, Schelling, was invited back to Berlin explicitly in order to stamp out the dragon seed of Hegelian pantheism, which the Prussian authorities considered to be an active threat. Clearly, pantheism was still the source of significant controversy. In attendance at Schelling's lectures were Engels, Bakunin, and Kierkegaard, who would go on to become the leading thinkers of Marxism, anarchism, and existentialism, respectively. Indeed, if the conception of God as the one substance, Spinoza's conception of God, shocked the age in which it was proclaimed, because individual freedom was lost within it, why shouldn't the conception of God as the absolute idea, Hegel's conception, be any less shocking? Rather than a cog in the great machine of nature, as in Spinoza, doesn't Hegel turn us into cogs in the great machine of the absolute idea? Perhaps, as Kierkegaard would go on to insist, despite Hegel's efforts to find a place for individual freedom in the self-unfolding of absolute spirit, this place is still not large enough. Perhaps there is more to human life than merely playing a small role in this larger process. For Marx, and later Adorno, Hegel's apparent justification of historical suffering and injustice as means to the end of the self-realization of absolute spirit seemed to be perverse. Could the disasters of history really be justified by art, religion, and philosophy, which they ultimately produced? Was spirit's own self-knowledge a good enough reason for all of history's trials and tribulations? For Marx, humanity still had a ways to go, only through a political revolution in which all domination and oppression was abolished. Could the ultimate promise of philosophy be realized? For Adorno, the catastrophes of the 20th century, the Holocaust above all, constituted historical refutations of Hegel's philosophy. The very notion that these disasters could be construed as merely necessary negative moments 
in spirit, self-actualization would be a desecration of the memory of the victims. Finally, it would be worth considering an objection, one among many, mounted by the 20th century Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig in his masterpiece, The Star of Redemption. Recall that Hegel claims that religion and philosophy have the same content in different forms. Religion in the inadequate form of representation, philosophy in the adequate form of the concept. Thus, philosophy comprehends the truth of religion, above all religious revelation, in a higher conceptual form. But Rosenzweig asks, is it really true that philosophical conceptuality is higher than revelation? Or is it possible that revelation is higher, revealing truths to us that philosophy itself can never provide and can never exhaustively comprehend? Whereas philosophy would be the journey of the human being up towards God through the use of human reason, revelation would be the descent of God to humanity, speaking to us with a divine voice from above in a radically unforeseeable and incomprehensible fashion. Of course, this requires a conception of God that is irreducible to humanity. As Emil Fackenheim insisted, the distinction between God and humanity is one that Judaism refuses to dialectically overcome, as in Hegel. Indeed, Rosenzweig faults Hegel no less than Spinoza, for collapsing the distinctions between God, the world, and humanity, making any genuine notion of creation, the God-world relation, revelation, the God-humanity relation, and redemption, the humanity-world relation, impossible. For Rosenzweig, the ultimate unity of God, the world, and the human being, the ultimate realization of the divine one-all, so to speak, is not yet present, but remains to be achieved in the future redemption. As the prophet Zechariah puts it, on that day, in that future day, God will be one, and his name will be one. No doubt a Hegelian may have responses to offer to each of these objections, but this will have to be left for a future discussion. This brings our series to a close. So where are we left after this long exploration of the pantheism controversy? at the end of our journey from nihilism to absolute spirit. Hegel's philosophical system would prove to be hugely influential throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, but almost exclusively as a target for criticism against which other new philosophical traditions and movements could oppose themselves. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty once said, all the great philosophical ideas of the past century, the philosophies of Marx and Nietzsche, phenomenology, German existentialism, and psychoanalysis had their beginnings in Hegel, to which could also be added analytic philosophy and American pragmatism as well. Each of these new movements continued to grapple, whether implicitly or explicitly, with the problem of nihilism and the death of God, which first reared its head in the pantheism controversy. Though they may each have been dissatisfied with Hegel's proposed solution, it is from a confrontation with the limits of his attempt that these subsequent thinkers spread it up. Which isn't to say that there aren't also Hegelians today. Indeed, we are witness to a veritable renaissance in the study of Hegel and German idealism more broadly in contemporary philosophy. Some of the leading lights of both the continental and the analytic traditions are devotees of Hegel. I have in mind Slavoj Žižek and Robert Brandom, respectively both of whom have written at least one 800-plus page tome on Hegel that brings him into conversation with the most cutting-edge contemporary philosophical developments, showing Hegel to still be a vital voice speaking to us here and now in the current philosophical moment. Why this renewed interest in Hegel today, from all sides of the philosophical spectrum? Perhaps because the problem of nihilism and the death of God the problem that first inspired Hegel and his fellow German idealists to try to take a new step forward in the development of philosophy thanks to the pantheism controversy. These problems are still our problems today. Decades after Hegel's death, Nietzsche would revive the problem of nihilism by declaring again that God is dead, returning these issues to the forefront of philosophical consciousness. 
Nietzsche himself would become a key reference point for the subsequent rise of existentialism, phenomenology, psychoanalysis, critical theory, deconstruction, and eventually postmodernism and poststructuralism. To paint with a broad brush, postmodernism like Nietzsche himself strive to respond to the problem of nihilism by turning against the Western philosophical tradition, not unlike the comparable anti-philosophy from the later Wittgenstein and Rorty in the analytic tradition, which for various reasons they took to be complicit with the nihilistic attitude. If the return to Hegel today signifies anything, it would be the thought that philosophy still has something to offer us. Philosophy as the quest to know the true and the good, to know ourselves and to know God. The problems of faith and reason, religion and philosophy, necessity and freedom, God and the soul, these are not antiquated or foreign problems of mere historical interest for a bygone era of philosophizing. These are universal human problems. These are our problems. Perhaps the way to grapple with them is to take a new step forward in the great adventure of philosophy, to continue the conversation, to write a new chapter of the story. And I should think that Hegel would be the first to accept that his own philosophy is not the final word, that new developments in human thought must always be made. If philosophy is always its own time apprehended in thought, as Hegel tells us, then the new times in which we live will require new philosophy, a new stage in God's self-realization, a new step forward in absolute spirit, if not a step beyond absolute spirit itself. After all, it was Hegel who said, spirit is indeed never at rest, but always engaged in moving forward. So keep moving forward, keep being restless, and as always, keep seeking.